All right, Judges chapter 5. So tonight, I'm going to sing you a song, Deborah's song. I'm not going to sing a song for you, so you don't, don't get up and leave. But we're going to talk about this song in the Bible, which is what we just read. We just read a song. Did you know that? So we're, we're going to talk about Deborah's song. We're going to talk about why Deborah's song is in the Bible, what it means, and what we can learn from it. And just the point of songs in the Bible as well. We're going to talk about that and, you know, the power of songs. And I ran a little experiment um, before church, and I'm going to kind of explain to you the power of songs in the Bible. All the kids were involved in the experiment. It was successful, kids. You, you might have thought it was a failure, but it was a successful experiment. I'll explain as we get into it. But let's go ahead and look down at Judges chapter 5. So where are we in Judges? So we just looked at Judges chapter 4 last week. That was the story of Deborah freeing um, the people, using uh, sending Barak to fight against Jabin and the Canaanites and Sisera, his general, and to um, slay him. We heard the story of, of Jael killing Sisera. So let's look down at Judges chapter 5 and verse number 1 and see what we can learn from Deborah's song. So we already know the story, right? What's the point of another chapter talking about the same thing? So let's look at Judges chapter 5, look at verse number 1. It says, the Bible says, Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, saying, Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel, when the people willingly offered themselves. Hear ye, O kings, give ear, o, o ye princes. Even I, I will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praises unto the Lord God of Israel. So we're about to hear this song. And in Judges chapter 4, it begins and it says, Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled, and the heavens dropped, the clouds also dropped water. We're going to talk about that detail a little bit later, but it's telling us a little bit about what happened. In number, verse number 5, the Bible says, The mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied, and the travelers walked through the byways. So first of all, who was Shamgar? Go back to Judges chapter 3 and look at verse number 31. You don't hear a lot about Shamgar in the Bible, but the Bible mentions him here in Judges chapter 5 and verse 6, and then it mentions him the first time in Judges chapter 3 and verse 31, and the Bible says this, it says, And after him was Shamgar the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goat, and he also delivered Israel. So Shamgar was a judge that delivered Israel from the Philistines at that time. He, sl he slew all these Philistines with a cattle prod, the Bible says. So look back at verse number 6, and it says in the days of Shamgar, and it tells us kind of how things were back then. In the days of, so Shamgar was basically the judge between Ehud and Deborah. Okay, you have this man Shamgar, and there's not a lot of detail about him in the Bible, but we see it in verse number 31 of Judges 3, and then we see the details of what things were like both during Shamgar's time and after Shamgar's time in verse number 6, and it says, it says, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through byways. So that tells you that it was a dangerous time. It was dangerous. It was not good to be out. People, when, when they went to travel somewhere, they didn't walk on the highway or they didn't walk on the main road. They went through the woods. You know, they went through, you know, different paths because it was just dangerous. Look down at verse number 7. It continues to tell us about what things were like back then. And it says, The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. So look, they could no longer even dwell. When it says the villages, it's talking about the outskirts, the outer small towns. You know, this is small town America or small town Israel here. It's saying that people couldn't live there because they had to go into the, probably the gated cities, the larger cities, because you know, it just was so unsafe due to, you know, first with Shamgar, the Philistine oppression, and then after, you know, with Deborah, before that they were oppressed by the Canaanites. Okay, so look, and it showed, again here it says, until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel, showing once again that Deborah was a judge of necessity here. And she was kind of like one of those situations where somebody has to do something is what the Bible is telling us here. In verse number 8, they chose new gods. Then was war in the gates, 
Was their shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? Now that's interesting right there. Okay, because first of all, you know, in both of these cases with the Philistines, go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. I'm not going to dwell on this, but it's something to point out. Okay, they were invaded by the Philistines. Then after that, they were invaded by the Canaanites. So these people are under oppression. They're under oppression during that time. There's been no battle yet. The battle was to get out of oppression that we're going to read about with Deborah and Barak. But look, the bottom line is they were no longer armed. These people had no weapons. They had nothing to defend themselves with. I mean, why do you think he's fighting with a cattle prod? He's fighting with a cattle prod, not because it's a better weapon. It's because they had no weapons. Okay, look at 1 Samuel chapter 13. This is King Saul hundreds of years later, maybe 400 years later. And look, you will see that with the Philistines, you know, this just kind of keeps happening. These Philistines are warmongering people. And in 1 Samuel chapter 13, Saul and Jonathan, you know, they're getting ready to push back the Philistines and go to war with the Philistines. And look at verse number 19. The Bible says this. Now look, there hasn't been a war yet. There hasn't been a war yet in the Bible. And it's just in verse number 19 of 1 Samuel 13, look what the Bible says. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share, his coulter, his axe, and his mattock. They're basically using farm tools to go to war here. And yet they had, file, they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and Jonathan, his son, there was there found. So only Jonathan and Saul had swords and spears, had actual weapons here. So the point here is at the beginning of both wars here, there were already no weapons amongst the people. Isn't that interesting? I mean, it wasn't a war to get rid of the weapons. At the time of the war, when they were trying to get their liberty back, before they went into bond, you know, when they were trying to get out of bondage, they already had no weapons. Okay? To the, and it was a Philistine in both cases. But they were completely disarmed. So, not the point of tonight's sermon, but something to think about. Okay? Judges chapter 5, look at verse number 9. Judges chapter 5, in verse number 9. Look at the Bible, what the Bible says. My heart is towards the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. So this shows you that there were some leaders that arose to fight this war with Deborah. That's good. Look at verse number 10. Speak ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment, and walk by the way. So like, look, some people were standing up. Some people were saying, we will go fight. Obviously, there was, you know, thousands and thousands of people, even more than that, we'll see in this song, were standing up. Some people were still sitting in judgment. You know, there wasn't just Deborah judging at the time. She was, you know, a judge, but, you know, the Bible says that others were sitting in judgment here in Israel, and Deborah, in the song, is praising them for that. So she's basically kind of giving credit where credit is due. You know, after this battle is won is when they write this song, and she's basically saying, look, hey, we didn't do this by ourselves. You know, there was lots of people that helped here and stood up, and she's saying, praise God for you. Bless ye the Lord. Verse 11, they that are delivered from the noise of the archers in the place of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gate. So I, we don't exactly know what this means here, but people were either escaped from a dangerous place here and, you know, lived to fight another day and, and then got into this battle. But look, the, the Bible says that, you know, they were no longer going to have to live in fear in their villages. Look back at verse number 7. Look back at verse number 7 when it says, Even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel, then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. Remember that in the villages they ceased. They, they couldn't live there anymore because it was too dangerous. It, there was too much oppression and danger going on in the nation. Look at verse number 12. So it doesn't paint... It doesn't paint a very good picture about what was happening in the nation at the time, but the interesting thing about the song is this. It does paint a picture. It does paint a picture of actually what was happening. You're kind of starting to see the point of the song, aren't you? Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. 
Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. So this was either talking about, you know, um, that they had dominion over the nobles of Jabin after the battle was over, or possibly there was some nobles in Israel that didn't fight. One of those two things. But the bottom line is that, that you know, they were made to have dominion over, you know, everybody in Canaan and possibly even some Israelites who wouldn't do anything at the time. Okay, look at verse 14. Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among thy people, out of Maker came down governors, and out of Zebulun, they that handle the pen of the writer. So now she's giving credit to all the tribes that came to help in the war. So we're about to get into this war, and she is giving, you know, in the song, Deborah and Barak are giving credit to the tribes that came and had, you know, and helped them out. You know, they were against the Canaanites, against Amalek. So Benjamin helped, you know, out of Maker came governors, leaders, the Bible says, out of Zebulun, they that handled the pen of the writer. That's kind of an interesting statement, saying, hey, you know, these guys were like intellectual, even the college professors came to help us fight, is what, you know, the Bible is saying here. Even the people that were, you know, this isn't their trade. Their trade wasn't to be a warrior. You know, they came down, they put their pens down, and they fought with us. Judges chapter 5, look at 15, verse 15. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Even Issachar and also Barak, he was sent on foot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben's, there were great searchings of heart. So here we see a difference. Here we see a difference. She's giving all these tribes that helped out in the war, and she's memorializing them in this song, but then she's saying, but in Reuben there was divisions. She's saying, Reuben, you know, there were great thoughts of heart. You know, Reuben was kind of like, uh, you know, Reuben's a tribe, okay? Reuben was a person, which interestingly enough, go back to um, Genesis chapter 49. Go to Genesis chapter 49 and look down at verse uh, number 3. Jacob is blessing his son. So here we have the tribe of Reuben. You know, it doesn't say that everybody from Reuben didn't go help Deborah, but it does say that there was divisions amongst Reuben, which is interesting because Reuben himself was an unstable person, the Bible says. And Jacob, when he's blessing his sons, look at verse number 3. When he gets to Reuben, the Bible says, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and excellency of power unstable as water thou shalt not excel. Because thou went up to thy father's bed, and defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. So we're not going to get into that story, but the bottom line is Reuben in his life was unstable, which is, you know, it matches how the actual tribe of Reuben, you know, behaved in this situation. They were unstable, they were unreliable, they were divided. Okay, and look, I mean, the Bible says, look at verse 3 in Genesis 49, verse 3. That, that stuff sounds pretty good. I mean, this could be like a sermon series. Be, look, being unstable, I mean, just forget the notes for a minute. Being unstable could be a sermon series that's like 50 sermons long. Because you could be the most, you can have some very strong character in many different places in your life, but if you're unstable, it wrecks it all. Look at all the things in verse number 3. My might the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, the excellency of power. Look at all these things. I mean, look, these are, these, are, these are good traits. These are good things. But he's unstable. Think of you're just like this really like super hard worker. You're just like, you just like when you get going, you're just killing it. And then, but you just, you can only do that for like two days a week. Or you can only do it for three months out of the year. Or you can only do it for a week and then you, 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 you just get unstable and you fall off a track somewhere. Look, I mean, say you're really good at coming to church. I mean, you know, you can come to church and you just like, you hit it for like six weeks in a row and then you're just like, yeah, I'm not into church anymore. And then you have to have your life wrecked for, you know, two months. And then you come back in. I mean, look, I mean, these are unstable people. I mean, when they're in it, they're in it, but then they're just unstable. Okay, so look, this was the tribe of Reuben. And I don't know if it, if it stemmed from, uh, you know, the way Reuben was, the way the tribe was that way. I don't know how that would actually work. But the bottom line is it's an interesting connection. But the tribe of Reuben was undecided, is what the Bible is saying. Go back to Judges chapter 5. Being unstable in your life will ruin a lot of things for you, no matter what. Look at verse number 
16. The Bible says this. It says, Why abodest thou amongst the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben were the great searchings of heart. So, I mean, that just goes to, again to show you that being unstable, it's, first of all, it's just confusing and it must be so stressful to be unstable. Where everything, everything that you do in your life, everything that, every decision that you make in your life is just this searching of the heart. Think about it. You know, am I going to go to, to work tomorrow? Well, I just got to search my heart about that. You know, am I going to do what I'm supposed to do, you know, for my family? Am I going to provide for my family? Am I going to, you know, come to church and be committed, you know, to the house of God? Well, I just got to search my heart every single time for that. You know, that's Reuben. That's this tribe right here. And they're divided. It was a great division. So Reuben was split. Some went and some did not. The tribe. Now look, now every, here's another thing about Reuben and about, you know, we saw these, these verses before this with the tribes like, hey, you know, bless ye the Lord and all these. And, you know, these people came down and they fought with us. And they're memorializing this song in the Bible. But here's what you got to remember. Everyone will always remember how you act in trying times. So you want to be on the, on the right side of this because, look, those are times, those are times when history is made. We're making history here in this song. You know, this is the times when history is made, when songs are written about people, right? I mean, you want to be on the good side, not have people singing about how you stayed with the sheep and how you had to search your heart on whether or not it was the right thing and you wouldn't go and fight and all these things. So, or, or, you know, how people singing about how you ran and you weren't on the right side. I mean, that would be terrible to have you memorialized in that way. Look at verse 17. Gilead, abode beyond Jordan. So here's another tribe. This is Gilead, the tribe, the tribe of Gad, on the other side of the Jordan. Why did Dan remain in ships? So Dan didn't go. Dan, of course, is on the coast. Asher continued on the seashore. Dan and Asher, both on the coast, didn't fight. Is that a shocker? <laughs> are, are you catching what I'm saying here? I mean, look, the, the people on the coast, they just didn't go at all. They're just like, whatever. We're going surfing. Or we're going to stay in our ships. More nations and tribes were, are listed here that did not help in this great war. Look at verse 18. Zebulon and Naphtali were a people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. These are the people in the, the center part of Israel, you know, not on the coast. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. Look, they were just fighting for liberation, not money. They were fighting for the right reasons. Then the Bible says in verse 20, they fought, now we see a little shift here. The Bible says, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. So this is kind of the, the, the force multiplier of this battle right here because we know that Sisera you know, had all these iron chariots. He was very powerful. But look, this is where the battle is won. In verse 20, it says, they fought from heaven. Who fought from heaven? The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. You know, look, I mean, whether this meant they were fighting at night, whether it means that, you know, there was angels in the fight, I'll show you that there was at least one angel in this fight. And like, you know, as we've seen other places in the Bible, that's pretty much all you need if, if you have an angel on your side. You know, but this is some sort of heavenly battle that God is involved in, is what the Bible is telling us here. And then the Bible says in verse 21, the, now we see how the iron chariots, by the way, in, verse, in chapter 3, or chapter 4, it was just like, you know, the iron chariots were just defeated. Now we see how the iron chariots were defeated in verse 21. It says, the river of Kishon swept them away, that ancient river. The river Kishon, O my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Go back to verse number 4. Go back to verse number 4 in the Bible. Where the, look, what the, look what the Bible says in verse number 4 of Judges chapter 5. So the Bible says the river swept them away. And in verse number 4, I told you I'd explain this. The Bible says when thou marched out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. And the clouds also dropped water. So there was a massive 
rainstorm here. There was a flood that flooded this river and washed all these chariots away, washed this army away. The clouds dropped water, the heavens dropped. I don't know if that meant hail or fog or whatever that meant. Implying that, but, but look, this is how the Lord, or partly out of the way, it says that the mountains came down. I don't know if that's landslides or what that was. But look, God, you know, basically won this battle for them. And it's implying how the Lord defeated the 900 chariots of iron here with just this, this simple army. Look at verse 15. The Bible says in verse 15 of Judges 5, And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted... This is uh, chapter 4, sorry. So that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. So in chapter 4, I just want to point out here, in chapter 4, that's all you really hear, is that, you know, the Lord discomforted Sisera. But now we get all these details in the song. Okay, we get all the details about the heavens dropping and the stars and, you know, they fought from heaven. You know, who fought from heaven? So, I mean, it's saying that there's a heavenly part of this battle is what we're seeing here. And that the mountains came down, that, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the mountain came down, the Bible says. But look, in uh, Judges chapter 22, 5 and verse number 22, we see more details. It says, then were, they, then were the horse hoofs broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. And then the Bible says this. This is how I know there was an angel there. Curse ye, Meroz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to help, to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. So this is another place that didn't help another group of people living in a place that didn't help, and the angel of the Lord that is fighting says, curse you for not helping us. So it's not that, you know, you have to be against the Lord, you just have to be not with Him, is what this angel basically proves here. But look, there's at least one angel. And, and you know, that's probably all you need. You give me an angel, and we're good. All right? Look at verse 24. Now we get into the story of Sisera escaping, and this is captured in the song as well. Blessed above women shall Jael the wife of Heber the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be among, above women in the tent. So we see, you know, we're remembering those who did not fight, who did fight. Look at Judges chapter 5 and verse number 25, and we see the story of Jael. He asked water, and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. So she didn't just give him milk. She gave him some butter. You know, she's trying to get, you know, his blood sugar up. So, I mean, she wants to put this guy to sleep, right? So we saw that last, last week. But look, in verses 26, the Bible gives us even more detail than we saw last time. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer, she smote Sisera. And look what it says here. She smote off his head. When she had pierced and stricken through his temples. So she, she pierced him with a nail. Now, first of all, I was in Home Depot yesterday, and I, I was looking for, I, I'm like, I wonder if I could find a nail like this. I think this here would do it right there. So I found a nail that JL used. So this is the kind of nail that she drove through his head, and then she cut his head off, the Bible says. After that. Okay, so look, JL is memorialized, and we see some more detail once again um, from this story. Can you believe this is only like, 40 cents? I mean, that's quite a nail. Anyway, I'll, jail, I'll give it to you after the sermon. If, okay, don't give her a hammer. Okay, the Bible says in verse number 27, so she cut his head off. We see more details here. She wanted to make sure this guy wasn't getting up. All right, verse 27, at her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay down. At her feet he bowed, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, then he fell down dead. The mother of Sisera looked out a window. Now we're seeing Sisera's mother looking for him coming back from the battle. Now this is probably anecdotal here. The Bible says, And cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Her wise ladies answered her, Yea, she returned answer to herself. Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every man a damsel or two? To Sisera, a prey of diverse colors, a prey of diverse colors of needlework, of diverse colors of needlework on both sides, meet for the necks of them that take the spoil. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that, let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might, and the land had rest forty years. So we just see this anecdotal story of how his mother was wondering, why hasn't Sisera come back to me? Because Jael killed him. She cut his head off after she drove a nail through his head. 
Okay, so look, my point of trying to make here in Deborah's song is that we see a lot of additional detail in the story laid out in this song. I mean, look, we see that the pre people, the people of the land of Israel, they were greatly oppressed at this time, before this battle. They were, they were disarmed at this time. They were completely an unarmed nation. They were, you know, traveling in the country at this time was unsafe. You had to go through the, the woods or the wilderness or wherever. They had to use the byways, the Bible says. They were oppressed even in their villages. They didn't have villages. They couldn't live there. They ceased in the villages. They had to go back into the, the main cities because it was so unsafe. There was a great war detailed here by Deborah and Barak in which many tribes of Israel came to fight. We didn't see that detail in chapter 4 on which tribes came to fight and which tribes did not fight and for what reason. And then the Bible says, look, the Lord fought from them, for them from heaven either you know, with an angel, you know, angels, a flood, and you know, other natural disasters or whatever, or both. And then Jael, of course, kills Sisera with a nail and cuts off his head and kills the main general. Look, it's quite a story. All this put into a song. So, the question is, and the application this evening is this. Why, I mean, why a song? Why not just tell the story? Why not just write the words down? Because, I mean, to us, right? I mean, I'm not singing to you up here. I mean, we wouldn't know the tune of this song. But why, why did they write a song? So why a song? And the, bo the bottom line is this. Go to Exodus chapter 15. It's not the only song by, by, by far in the Bible. It's not the only song. In Exodus chapter 15, just look down at verse number 1. Songs in the Bible carry a message. They carry a message. They tell a story in the Bible. Look at Exodus chapter 15 and verse 1. The Bible says this. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And then Moses' song goes on from there. But the bottom line is, it's a song talking about the great victories that God has performed for them, freeing them from the Egyptians. It's all put into a song. It's to tell and to memorialize the story of the exodus of, of the Israelite people. So why? Why? It's so, so they wouldn't forget what God did for them. It is why they put it in a song. Think about the Psalms. Those are songs. Those are songs. Think about all the truths that are in the book of Psalms that are songs. I mean, they're just, it's, it's so we can remember and we will not forget you know, all the great truth that God has for us all the things that God has done for us, like the Exodus, like the battle of Barak and Deborah to free themselves from the Canaanites. But look, why can't we just tell the story is the question. Okay, so this comes, this brings you to my, my experiment that I did with the kids before church. Okay, why can't you just tell the story? Why not just say, okay, we're just going to tell the story. And I mean, look, I've, I've told plenty of stories in, in, my, in my life. Okay, especially if you're ever familiar with like hunting or fishing. I mean, I am really good at telling a, a hunting story. I just can't have Garrett around because he's like, no, it, the horns were not that big. And I'm like, silence. It's my story. So look, but the point is, is that this song had a specific purpose. So I did an experiment with the kids. I lined up, I think it was seven kids in a row, and I just gave them a simple phrase and I gave them a phrase, I gave the phrase to one kid, and then he was to whisper it in the ear of the next, and the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. It's the game of telephone, if you've ever heard this game. Okay, so here's the, the phrase that I gave the kids, and the whole thing lasted about three minutes. And I was talking, and I was visiting with them during the whole exercise, you know, maybe trying to get them thinking about something else. But this is a three-minute exercise with like six words. So imagine how messed up you know, a story could get you know, if this is what happens to six words. The this, this phrase that I gave the kids was this, a guppy in a shark tank. That is what I told Jacob. He was the first one in the line. I blame him for everything because I told him. And what I got back, I told him, a guppy in a shark tank. And what I got back was 
a shark attack. <laughs> now look, obviously, I mean, we still got the shark in there, but obviously, look, the message got confused. Okay, obviously, some, I mean, it's based on, look, messages, stories, they're all based on people's bias. Look, obviously, one of these kids was very biased, very prejudiced against sharks. I mean, obviously, one or many of the kids thought that sharks were just inherently violent. It's not right. But the point is that somebody injected their opinion, they added to the story, they added to the sentence, and then they took other things away. That's how stories get messed up, right? Maybe somebody in a story was there and witnessed something from a different perspective. Maybe, you know, the story in their mind changes inadvertently. Like they didn't, you know, they, have you ever misremembered something? I mean, we just, we just did an experiment with one short sentence. Imagine a complex story. You know, details would just be left out, added, changed, period. But look, I mean, it also shows us, look, this little game that we played also shows us the danger of listening to secondhand information. Okay? I mean, like gossip. Turn to Proverbs chapter 18. This is not the point of, of the sermon, but look, you need to be careful listening to information from people that said, I heard that this guy said so-and-so about so-and-so. I mean, you need to be careful with things like that because it's almost never the truth. Look at Proverbs chapter 18. And by the way, this is way too common today. This is way too common today where people just think that it's okay to just talk about people behind their back and just, you know, people just think it's fine. I, I don't know why, but they do. Okay, look at Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 8. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. So by, the Bible says that people that go around telling tales about people, they, look, they might not even mean harm by it. They might not even mean harm by it. But look, that's why you need to be careful about talking about things that do not pertain to you or that you haven't heard. You just need to ask yourself. Here's a good check. You just need to always ask yourself, if that person was here, would they be okay with me saying what I'm saying right now? Right? That's why many times you can just get, get, get rid of situations like that by somebody that comes to you and says, hey, do you know Brother Bob said this to me, and you know, what do you think about that? And I was like, well, let's go talk to Brother Bob about it and work it out. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Because Brother Bob didn't say that. And they know that. They're spinning something to convince you, to manipulate you, to flatter you, something. Okay? So look, it, it, the bottom line is if there's a situation going on that you don't have influence or involvement in, just stay out of it. Turn to Proverbs 26. The Bible says this in Proverbs 26, 17. It says, he that passeth by, I mean, the people that just have to get involved in every little detail, every little, you know, squabble, every little mess that's going on in somebody else's life. I mean, look, don't you have your own problems? I mean, the, the Bible says this. It says, he that passeth by and meddleth with strife belonging not to him is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. I mean, there's a picture for you, right? Grabbing a dog by the ears. You know, if you grabbed our dog by the ears, you'd probably just get a lot of slobber all over you. I mean, you probably wouldn't get hurt. But I mean, the point is that it's, it's just a messy situation. You're not supposed to do it. You know, so you'll just get yourself in trouble. You'll hurt people. Just be careful. It's way too common today. Back to songs. So here's why songs, so look, songs are, here's why songs are used in the Bible. Songs are used in the Bible because of the fact that songs are so powerful in preserving and delivering a message or a story. That's why. I mean, look, in Deborah's case, I mean, look at all the different details that we saw in the song that we didn't see in just the story. And it helps people remember. Look, I mean, Moses, Exodus, the same thing. But look, here's the thing. There's many bad examples of this, too. Okay, there's many bad examples. You ever heard the saying, I got that song stuck in my head? How many times has that happened to you? I mean, we've talked about you know, the earworms in the sermon last year. But look, the power of music and culture cannot be understated. You know, I've heard this so many times in my life from people that, you know, listen to songs and even, you know, after myself, I, I got rid of worldly music in my life and things like that. You know, I heard people say, I just like the tune. I don't listen to the words. I just like the tune. But look, the song of Deborah and Barak tells the details of the story. The lyrics matter, folks. I mean, the lyrics matter. Now look, I grew up, the culture that I grew up in was country music. That's the culture that I grew up in. 
Okay, and it, it, this, this fits for any kind of culture that you came from. But look, the themes, the themes were pretty much the same in all the songs. And it's, it's the same in all the different cultures of music, the genres, or whatever you want to call them. But look, it's funny how the themes in country music are actually realities in the places that people listen to those songs. Isn't that funny? It's not just a song. The lyrics matter. They've, they've changed, they've reflected the culture. They're helping change the culture. I mean, you think about it, you know, the, 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 the things in country music, the culture, right? And it's, it's a lot of the same things in, in like hip hop. It's, it's a lot of the same thing, by the way. Yeah. It, it's just, it's packaged differently. And it's packaged, you know, for a, a different part of the country or whatever. It's the same message. Yeah. It's the same message, you know, the drinking, right? That what's a man? What's a man? What's a man? A man's a hard-drinking whoremonger. That's a cowboy. That's what that is. Right? I mean, they glorify things like, you know, like the cowboy way, whatever that even means. You know, like going off and, you know, I'm going to go and rodeo and, and leave my family behind and my wife left me because, you know, i got to get to another rodeo. I mean, this is real. But they glorify this type of thing. Right? And look, people live their lives this way. You know, my wife is leaving me, and my family left me. It's glorifying that. Yeah, that you know, I mean, just, just whoremongering, fornication, all this stuff. It glorifies all of it. And it makes the situations, look, it makes the situations sound heroic. Yeah. I mean, it makes the situations, I mean, everybody had, when I was growing up, had a good view of a cowboy. You know, you were tough, and you were just, you know, this, this rodeo hero and all this kind of stuff. I mean, look, I mean... It, it, it creates a culture. And, and it's because of the music. I mean, look, I mean, any other hip hop culture is the same thing. I mean, rap music or whatever, it's the same thing. It glorifies all the same sins in a different, in a different way. And, and it's all just as bad. It makes it, it makes it look good. It makes it look fun. And it, and it, actually, it actually affects the culture of the areas, of the, of the regions. It, it affects, I mean, the lyrics matter, folks. It's not, just a, it's not just a beat. It's not just a tune. People are listening to the words. And they're putting those words into action in their life. I mean, it's changing people. I mean, look, it's, it's, a, it's glorifying a message. And it's a, look, it's a detailed message. That's the thing with music. They can tell you a detailed message in a song, and you'll never forget it. Isn't that something? That's why we have songs in the Bible. You know, things were put to music to remember them, to preserve the details of the story. It's all good, but Satan uses the same technique. He uses the same thing. Which is why, look, it, it, which is why we just need to be careful with what we're filling our minds with. Right. Notice I didn't say filling our ears with. Because what you, what you listen to, what you see, folks, will, will affect your mind. It'll ultimately affect your heart. I mean, look... Don't you feel good? And by the way, I mean, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. If you listen to all this music, you know, whether it be hip hop or rock or, or whatever else there is, or country music, I mean, the funny thing for me was I always thought country music was more wholesome than you know other. I always thought that I was, you know, it was it was more of a wholesome thing that I was listening to country music, you know, when I was younger. But the funny thing is, when you actually listen to the words, if you go back and listen to it now, right, you know what, guess what, I don't even have to listen to it, because guess what, I can still hear the words. Because you don't forget the words. I can still hear the words, and I'm like, I can't believe I listened to that. I can't believe that that's what that song says. I can't believe that everyone thinks that this is okay. I mean, once you compare it to what the Bible says, and the standards here, I mean, it's bad. But then, another thing is, you will not want to listen to spiritual things. You will not enjoy hymns if you have all that garbage in your heart. You will not have the heart to listen to psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, look, these hymns, these hymns, these hymns tell a story. Every single one of these hymns tells a story. The battle hymn of the Republic, it tells a story. It tells a story of a, a soldier fighting in the Civil War. I mean, it tells a story. In verse number 4, the Bible says, you know, about, you know, it says, with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me 
As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. I mean, that is the story that this Union soldier is telling. And this, this song is retelling his life. It's retelling the situation that happened here in great detail. It's comparing it, you know, um, I love to tell the story, tells the story about Jesus. How many songs in the Bible tell the story about, in detail, about the sacrifice that Jesus made for us? And we remember it through those songs. Those are the kinds of things that we need in our mind, that we need to get stuck in our head, and that we need to have in our hearts. Amen. And we need to, I mean, look, they're, they're, they're important. They're useful. They're memorable. But we need to make sure that we're listening to the right ones. Amen. Because it can greatly affect us in, in a negative way or a positive way. It's up to us. And look, here's the thing. You've got to break the trend. You've got to break the trend. You're just like, I don't like listening to hymns. You've got to break the trend. You got, and guess what? Guess what? You're like, I don't like listening to hymns because I listen to worldly music, whether it be country or hip-hop or whatever it is. Guess what? If you're unstable, you'll never break the trend because you have to get into a situation where you're stable and you can feed yourself spiritual things. You can read the Bible. You can listen to the hymns. And, and guess what? You'll start to like it. It will change your heart. You'll start to like it. I mean, how many of you like to listen to hymns? How many, of you like, how many of you like getting a hymn stuck in your head all day long? I mean, I love that. But that didn't used to happen before I got stable in my Christian life. So it's all about stability. You can be, don't be a rocket ship Christian two weeks at a time. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Okay? Songs. Deborah's song. It's a great story in the Bible that gives us some more detail, and it's very memorable. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.